Welcome to segment six, Teamwork in Action. In the last segment, we talked about different forms of interprofessional work, ranging from teamwork to collaboration to coordination. And we heard about the team that works on the San Francisco General Hospital Acute Care for the Elders Unit. In this segment, we'll have the opportunity to see the ACE team in action and hear about some of the challenges they face in working together. One of the key components of teamwork is communication. Let's hear from Dr. Edgar Pierluisi about how the ACE team works together and communicates during rounds. Our team uh, works together through ACE rounds. Our uh, rounds are every day uh, for about 45 minutes where we round on all the patients in the unit that are in the ACE program, anyone over 65. What we do is having seen the patient, we bring our own understanding of what the patient really needs to recover from whatever illness they have and we discuss it as a group and then we create a care plan for that day we communicate to the primary team if we need to talk uh, outside of rounds afterwards we page or text each other when we have those communications all the time uh, we communicate during uh, ace rounds using a, a formal approach to the nurse's presentation so we have a checklist that we ask the nurse to present off of so the listeners know what to what what to expect and it gets to nurses thinking about uh, patients in a systematic in a systematic way um, and then we also have an order for who presents uh, when, so that there's no confusion about who's going to say what, and, it's try and it minimizes um, interruptions. And, uh, and finally, I try to summarize what uh, comes out of the meeting so that we're all in agreement uh, before we move on to the next patient. Now let's listen in on the ACE team morning rounds. As you listen to the rounds, pay attention to the communication in the team. Are members prepared to discuss the case from their discipline-specific perspective? Do all the team members contribute to the discussion? Is the discussion distributed amongst the team members, or is one member dominating? Finally, do team members appear to value and respect the opinions of others on the team? All right, Joyce here, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, good morning everyone. I have Mrs. S. She's a 78-year-old female, admitted from the medicine service. She's here because she had a fall at home. She was carrying her laundry and fell down the stairs. And with that, she sustained a right hip fracture, and it's day two of her I am nailing. So for her past medical history, she has hypertension and COPD. Her vitals this morning are stable. She's off oxygen now. She has good vision. She has cataracts, but she sees pretty well. Her hearing is perfect. For her skin, she sustained a laceration on her right forehead, and the elbow has a laceration as well, but I've covered it with curlics. Mm -hmm. For safety, she is on a false risk considering her fall at home, although she's not trying to get out of bed, but we're just putting that for safety. Mobility is such an issue because she doesn't want to get out of bed. She refused PT and OT yesterday, and um, it's because of her pain. She has eight out of 10 pain. It goes down with her morphine to four out of 10, but it's still an issue. Her cognition-wise, I did a um, mini-cog. She scored two out of three from the three-item recall. And her clock is normal, and this is her cognitive screen. Oh, great. Test. Thank you. Yeah. So it was reported overnight that she was confused. She pulled her IV, and it's been replaced. Now we covered it with Curlix. And for nutrition, she ate good breakfast. She ate 100%, she doesn't have any dentures. And for today, I think I need to work on, we have to address her pain, elimination issues, she still has a Foley, and no BM for three days. And we should work on her mobility, so we can get her walking soon. Thank you. Any pressure ulcers? Oh, I haven't seen the skin at the back, okay. but it was reported that she has Blanchable redness on her back. Okay, I'll take a look at her skin after the rounds. Okay, we'll do it together. Okay. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Joy. Just a little bit of additional history. There's no history of urinary incontinence uh, at home, but she does have mild constipation, which she uh, treats with diet mostly. She does have insomnia, and her primary doc is giving her some Zolpidem for that, and she uses it quite frequently, four to five times a week. Um, regarding her abnormal minicog, I did speak with her daughter, and she says she's had no issues at all with wandering or leaving stove on or whatever, but she has forgotten to pay some bills, and so her daughter is now um, doing that for her. This morning when I saw her, she was oriented. Uh, she uh, passed her five-digit recall. So she doesn't appear delirious at the, at the moment, but as you know, it waxes and wanes, so it's something to watch out for. It may, she may become confused later on in the day. I did try to get her out of bed and only got as far as dangling her legs, uh, mainly sec uh, secondary to pain. Um, given her abnormal testing and this history from the daughter, she probably has mild cognitive impairment or even dementia, and so I'll ask the team to check a TSH and a vitamin B12. And then given the fall, I'll ask that they start her on some cholecalciferol. Finally, I think we should stop her zolpidem and her haloperidol, but we'll talk about that more when Nam presents, and we can also discuss her pain regimen then. Susie? Yeah, um, thanks to Janae's help in doing some research, uh, found out her baseline. She lives alone. Um, she, her husband passed away two years ago. Um, her daughter and her daughter's family check on her a couple times a week. Um, this is her first fall. She is independent with ADLs and with most instrumental ADLs. Um, her daughter has taken over um, paying for some bills because she's forgotten to pay for a few. But um, other than that, the daughter feels like she's safe at home. Um, she does take the bus, sometimes gets a ride mm -hmm. from her daughter to see um, her doctor. Um, she uh, attends church on Sundays and was going to a senior center um, for some socialization and exercise, but has since stopped since her, her husband died. Um, as you know, Joy, we've been trying to evaluate her, and the pain is really making it challenging. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't completed the evaluation, and until her pain is controlled, we won't be able to, um, but once we know, she might be able to go home with services, or she might need to go to a skilled nursing facility for some inpatient rehab before returning home. Does she have any stairs at home? Um, she does. She has five stairs. Okay. So we're recommending an in-home safety eval, maybe? When she's going. If she's going to go straight home from here, then definitely a home safety eval. Mm -hmm. um, if she's going to go to a rehab facility, that would be something that the primary team might want to include in the DC summary. One more thing I forgot to tell you, Joy, and uh, we should prevent any complications related to the surgery. Mm -hmm. She probably doesn't have the ability to move that right foot off, up, up off the bed. So make okay. sure that heel is floated okay. and keep her knee bridge so she doesn't get a knee flexion contraction. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. So no. I looked at, I mean, I looked at her meds. She's on her home meds. Um, the only thing I'm concerned with is that, you know, it's post-op day two, um, very common to get post-op delirium on day two. Mm -hmm. Most likely in the elderly, it's due to pain. Okay. Um, she's only on IV morphine, but you said, yeah. does that it's does that help anything. when she gets it, though? It, it goes down to a four. Okay. It helps. Okay, but, but it doesn't control it, right? It, okay. It, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, um, if that's okay, I was going to suggest me Tylenol around the clock, plus or minus oxycodone, um, mm -hmm. see how she would tolerate that. Yeah, I think that's um, a good idea. If we can do that, so the 650 every six hours for Tylenol and then the oxycodone. Um, she's a smaller lady, so let's start off with 2.5 Q4 around okay. the clock, and then if she gets too sedated, then you don't have to give it. Um, I agree with the, the vitamin D um, for the fracture. The other thing was um, she hasn't had a bowel movement for three days. She's getting a lot of morphine, um, so let's go ahead and add Senna um, to her regimen. Um, let's see. Did you want to talk about the haloperidol? Yeah, I mean, my sense it should be stopped. Yeah, and maybe it's probably all from the pain, yeah. which is what I, w I was thinking too. Um, the Zolpidem, what did you, how do you feel about that? Also, you know, it has no role for her, maybe even contributed to her fall. Um, I'd like to stop it, but it's something yeah. that her primary was giving. So um, I'd like to at least lower the dose if we could here. Yeah, uh, or we can even try like 
melatonin or something yeah. if, if she really cannot sleep. Terrific, yeah. Mm-hmm. But those are just some things. We can run, run it by the team and talk to her about it too and see if she's comfortable with that. Okay. Okay. All right. Janae? Um, the family's pretty involved with her care, but they, um, they work during the day and they're not able to take off. So if she were to go home, um, we could, she qualifies for in-home supportive services and home health because she has both Medicare and Medi-Cal. But if she can't go home, then she pretty much qualifies for any skilled nursing facility. It just depends on how well she does. But I did notice that she seemed a little sad. The daughter um, said that since her husband died, she had cut back her on activities. Do you think that she looks a little bit depressed? It's hard to tell because she's always in pain, so I, I cannot distinguish at this time. Yeah, I agree. It really was hard to tell. She was kind of just lying there, but I really wasn't thinking of that when I went to go see her. So I can just see her after rounds and evaluate her formally for, for depression. Yeah. All right, so just to summarize, our recommendations then for this patient are, one, our usual mobility recommendations, remove the Foley catheter, adjust her pain meds with the Tylenol and the oxycodone, consider placing an ice pack on her right hip, lower the dose of the Zolpidem and stop the haloperidol, start a medication for bowel movement, and then ch- and check blood tests for cognitive impairment and start vitamin D, and then we'll check her after um, rounds for depression. Any other, anything else? Just um, as you know, Janae, and I would recommend this, you would, you would know, if she does go home, an in-home safety valve for uh, falls assessment right. mm-hmm. yeah, in I the house. Yeah, I can put that okay. on the home. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right, anything else? Great, yeah, let's move it. on to the next patient. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see from this video of the ACE team rounds, the structured communication that the team uses during team rounds ensures that all team members have the opportunity to share their expertise and recommendations. It also ensures that the team is clear on the goals and recommendations for the patient and knows how the day will go. Although teamwork has clear advantages for patients, as we discussed in the last segment, there are definitely barriers to working together. Let's hear from the ACE team members about some of the challenges they face in working collaboratively. Timing. Timing is very difficult because I have other rounds to go to, so it's not my own, own, thy only rounds here in the hospital. So timing is a big issue. For the nurses, they're giving meds in the morning, they're getting to know the patients, and then they have a break time. So right when they're supposed to be going to break, we're trying to call them in for rounds. Because my timing is I have to be here before because I have another round, so it's, it's timing is always the issue. And getting the nurses when they're not giving meds or but everybody's used to it and they see the value in it, so they do make the time to come see us. Some of the challenges that I personally have is that when the social worker discuss social issues, I don't quite follow because um, they're very, you know, she uses a lot of terminology, um, which over time I've had to learn, like 5150 or um, this person is medically conserved, or I'm not even sure if I'm using the right words, but you know, she uses a lot of terms that I'm not familiar with, which I'm sure in turn, when I discuss medications, she also may not understand fully. So I think that that is, that is one of the challenges. I feel like sometimes there are uh, debating goals between the different disciplines. And um, so that takes some finesse, some um, ability to keep your mouth closed and listen to everyone that's presenting their, their opinions and, and expert opinions. Um, and to ultimately, again, con- continue to consider that it's the patient's best interests um, that should be at the forefront of every decision made. And to be able to uh, maybe accept that my priorities with regards to the patient's healing may come at a a lesser value in the moment than, let's say, the pharmacist's recommendations or uh, the gerontologist's recommendations. In this segment, we had the chance to see an example of how one team uses structured rounds to effectively communicate. And we also heard about some of the perceived challenges that the team faces in working together. 
What examples of team communication have you seen in your setting, and how does that communication compare with the structured rounds used by the San Francisco General Hospital ACE team? What are the main barriers to interprofessional collaboration in your setting? I look forward to hearing from you on the discussion forum.